So, um, are there any questions about the final paper or anything like that before I start? No? Okay. So, um, today's reading, the reading for today was really long. <laughs> I don't know if people managed to do it or not, but uh, um, like, if you don't finish reading all of this book for this course and you've never read it before, remember that, that Tony Morrison said required reading. So <laughs> you have to read it even after the course. <laughs> um, so anyway, today's reading was very long. Um, it contains a lot more of Coates's uh, autobiography, right? So like, like Du Bois, um, and I guess like Cordova, well, and of course, like Thoreau, right? We always forget that it is, after all, always the first person who is speaking, <laughs> right? So, uh, but, you know, so like those people, uh, Coates writes as at least partly autobiography. So a lot of that happens in the reading for this time. Um, you know, I guess uh, there's three most important points. One is his time at Howard University, which he calls, um, and he never really explains why, <laughs> he calls it the Mecca. Um, I mean, considering he says that right after a section where he's been talking about Malcolm X, yes. I mean, Harvard University is directly back college, right? It's yeah. It's like the Mecca of the Black and Black School. Yeah, but why like Mecca specifically? No, I mean, yeah, so, yeah, Howard University is the preeminent historic Black college, right? So, and that's where he went. Uh, although, I think, as I mentioned before, he didn't end up graduating from Howard University. He... Um, um, left without a degree and took up journalism, um, but uh, um, and he says something about why the classroom wasn't the route for him. <laughs> and, um, but um, no, but I'm just so what I was in the middle of saying is like uh, he introduces the. Well, I'm planning to spend time on this, but maybe I should. So the end of last week's reading, there's a long discussion of Malcolm X and how he was attracted to Malcolm X. Um, and I mean, it seems like now he still loves Malcolm, Malcolm X in a certain way, but he also has distanced himself in some respects from Malcolm X. But, but in any case, so there's a long discussion of Malcolm X, and it ends with his, like his feeling that perhaps we could go, we should go back to his father's generation. And he mentions these Black Panther leaders and so forth. Um, Fred Hampton and Mark Clark were two Black Panther leader, leaders who were assassinated by the FBI, essentially. Um, so um, and then maybe we should go back to that. And then it, and then he ends, perhaps we should return to Mecca. And then there's one of these spaces that there is sometimes in the book. And then it says, my only Mecca was, is, and shall always be Howard University. So like, I feel like he must be thinking somehow about the actual Mecca, right? I mean, because that like the um, um, Malcolm X's uh, Hodge to Mecca was like a big, epic in Malcolm X's life. <laughs> but I don't know where to go with it farther than that. I mean, because like, so the actual Mecca is not um, really famous as a center of Islamic learning. That would be like Cairo or, you know, uh, 
um, like the great Shiite centers in Iraq and Iran, you know, I, so, I mean, it is a place where people from all over the Muslim world come together. And that was something important about Malcolm X's experience of it. But were you raising your hand again? Or yeah, you, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, it just kind of felt dark, but I mean, it could be sort of like, um, I mean, it's definitely a metaphor, but like a metaphor for like a place where you find belief. Yeah. Yeah. So, but actually what he finds there, and in a way what Malcolm X found in the real at Mecca was like released from a certain book. I, um, but I don't know. Anyway, I, you know, um, it's worth thinking about, but um, um, I don't have anything further to say about that at the moment. Um, uh, so he was there, I'm not sure exactly when, but sometime in the late 90s, I guess. I know he was there for sure in 1995, because although I haven't watched it, apparently there's a video of him as a student at Howard in 1995 participating in a like some kind of discussion. Um, so anyway, that's one thing. Then, of course, there's the birth of his son, Samori. That was in August of 2000. And then there's the killing of Prince Jones, which was the following month, right? He says Samori was a, was a month old when it happened. Um, so, I mean, uh, I'm gonna mention things about these events when they come up this this time and next time, but, um, but I, I guess, um, I'm not going to phrase my discussion of it in a like as a chronological, um, in a chronological order. I want to. I really. I want to talk about two things that um, I think two concepts or thoughts or views that Coates describes himself as acquiring by means of these experiences. Um, so. I mean, in no particular order, I'm not sure really if I had to decide which one should come first. These are these are both really important themes throughout the book. One is consciousness, and the other is cosmopolitanism. And on page 108, he says, Addressing Samori. The people who must believe they are white can never be your measuring stick. I would not have you descend into your own dream. I would have you be a conscious citizen of this terrible and beautiful world. Right? So conscious, and of course, cosmopolitan means citizen of the world or citizen of the cosmos. Um, um, in the reading for next time, this is on page 128, he says, remember that this consciousness can never ultimately be racial, it must be cosmic. Um, there's a This is another thing I don't quite know what to make of, although I'll have something more to say about it next time. There's a this kind of um, science fiction theme, <laughs> or I mean, science, I guess science fiction theme running through the whole book. Ray, that, that America is a galaxy, and when he goes to France, well, you haven't, that's the reading for next time, but when he goes to France, he, he says he, he boarded a starship. <laughs> um, he talks about the dark energy um, of the um, of the black world. Um, so you know this this cosmos thing is kind of like kind of on the border of that science fiction metaphor. But it, um, um, and sometimes, usually, it's kind of vague, right? 
sometimes it seems more precise. There's one point where, you know, where um, a lot of times he talks about what was outside his neighborhood in Baltimore as beyond the asteroids. <laughs> And at one point, he says that France seemed to him like Jupiter. So, I mean, Jupiter actually is beyond the asteroids. <laughs> maybe that's, maybe there's something precise there, but mostly it's, you know, you can't really tell the difference between is it interstellar or intergalactic or interplanetary or what, you know. Um, so, again, I'm not sure exactly what he's doing with that, except that it has something to do with the, you know, Um, the idea that there's a world whole and that true consciousness will require consciousness of the world whole. Um, and wherever you are is a, is a tiny spot in that. Um, so, um, So, okay, so I want to talk about these two things, and I guess in this order, um, there's going to be more about both of these things in the reading for next time, uh, especially in the remainder of part two, but also in part three. So, you know, I guess it would have been ideal to split the reading up part one, part two, part three, but part two is so much longer than part three that that didn't seem practical. Um, so, that, that's why I kind of stuck with like doing the first half of part two and then the second half. Um, but okay, so I'm just going to talk about consciousness. So first of all, um, maybe this is obvious, but I still feel like it's worth saying. So here, consciousness is means like being awake, right? Like it's the opposite of being asleep and dreaming. Um, which is probably the most common way we use the word conscious. We, um, it doesn't mean like the opposite of being a philosophical zombie, <laughs> if, if, if there is an opposite of that, <laughs> right? Um, in other words, it's not that part of metaphysics and epistemology that Coates is interested in. Um, and you can say the same for Descartes, right? So, um, um, but more specifically, right? So consciousness means like being awake, awoke. I don't think the word woke actually occurs in this book. I should have kept that, but I have a better track of that. But I don't think it does. But in any case, um, consciousness is means being awake. But specifically, um, what you find when you come to consciousness is that you have nothing but your body. Um, and this. Um, now, like, I think I told you before that I've been working for a long time on a, trying to write something about Coates and Descartes and Levinas. <laughs> um, so uh, maybe, well, but no, I think, I mean, it was this kind of thing that first led me to want to write about it, right? That, that's, what, that's what the meditator finds. Right, like this is the first meditation. How frequently has nocturnal rest persuaded me of these usual things that I am here wearing a gown seated by the fire when, however, my clothes having been removed, I am lying between the sheets. Exclamation point. As I say an exclamation point in that original. <laughs> so, um, right, the, the, the meditator has been dreaming about being clothed when the whole time they're really lying naked between the sheets. And of course, like even when you're awake and you're clothed, 
you still really only have your body under there, right? I mean, it's not really different than the sheets. <laughs> um, so, uh, so now, like, I'm not claiming that Coates is alluding to Descartes, um, that he intends to allude to Descartes. So this is, I mentioned this last time, but I mentioned last time that I, I hadn't found it, but this time I took the time to find it. So this is from Coates' blog, and it turns out it's actually from February 2013. I thought it was 2005, but it's 2013. Um, and, you know, there's a, um, well, the title of this entry is Western Thought for Avid Atheists and Sucker MCs. <laughs> and then it's, it's mostly about a long quote from Hobbes. Like, he, you know, there's a long quote from Hobbes on the imagination and how they, about the corporeal nature of the imagination, right? How, like, things influence our body and that, you know. So, and then, like, Coates is, just, is surprised to find that, you know, in this early modern philosophy, there's the, the philosopher, there's so much materialism and, um, and he asks, he says at one point, he starts it by saying, I'm going to need more help than usual here. <laughs> and at some point farther down, he says, do we have any, any info on the history of atheism and philosophy? When did it become okay to attack the idea of God? Was Hobbes accused of atheism in his own time? What came out of it, if so? How does his view of God compare with the view of his contemporaries? Descartes comes a lot up a lot here in reference to Hobbes, and he links, right? So the point is, in February 2013, he's, I mean, well, he's reading Hobbes, <laughs> um, uh, reading it very perceptively, I think, uh, wondering about Descartes, but clearly doesn't know very much about Descartes. And, you know, and this book was published in, it came out in July of 2015. So, um, I mean, it's pretty clear that that Coates is someone who like inhales books. <laughs> I mean, you know, so uh, like I guess I can't rule it out that sometime between February 2013 and I mean I don't know what the time scale is, but I assume the manuscript had to be in a you know quite a while before July 2015, right? So I can't rule out that somehow in that time, he, you know, Descartes had a huge influence on his thinking, but it seems prob like probably not, right? Like probably if there's parallelisms, it's because, um, well, they're both talking about the same thing. <laughs> um, and, you know, um, I mean, like, first of all, the fact that they're both talking about the same thing, I think like serves to, or should serve to back up what I was claiming last time that this, you know, that this book contains serious philosophy, even by the kind of technical standard that philosophy is about metaphysics and epistemology and stuff like that, right? Um, you might have to look for it a little bit, but, you know, I mean, that's true in Thoreau and true in Nietzsche and whatever, right? Um, but second of all, I think, I mean, so why does talking about this thing, why does talking about being awake versus being asleep and dreaming and deceived or self-deceived, right? At the end of the first meditation, the meditator says that like, um, I'm like a captive who uh, um, has been enjoying an imaginary liberty in dreams. And when later they come, they begin to suspect that they are sleeping, they are afraid to awaken. <laughs> right. So about awake, being awake versus asleep, dreaming, deceived, self-deceived, What's the connection between that and and discovering that you that what you really have is a body? Um, and I think I mean 
I think the experience of waking up through a dream, a dream really is the experience of suddenly being somewhere at a particular time. Um, that, that in a dream, you're not really. Um, uh, so I think it's, at the very least, it's that, it's an easy metaphor to reach for, but it, you know, it may, but it may be more than a metaphor. Like, I mean, why, why do we think that dreams are, are not real, <laughs> right? I mean, like at the end of the sixth meditation, or no, not the end, but in the sixth meditation, actually, I guess it is. It's in the last paragraph of the sixth meditation. The meditator says, well, now I know how to tell if I'm awake or, or, or not, right? That if I can connect what's happening to my memories of my whole life, and if I can uh, determine where everything is coming from and where it goes, like where everything is coming from when it appears and when it goes, where it goes when it disappears, then I can be sure I'm awake. <laughs> um, so, um, so being awake is knowing where you are inside this body between the sheets, uh, knowing where and when you are. And being asleep is somehow feeling free of that, right? So like when you, you know, in a dream, you you often, things will happen like kind of first you're watching someone do something and then you are the person who's, right? Um, first, first you're driving and then after a while you find out that you're walking. <laughs> um, so, uh, um, at least that's what happens to me in dreams. I don't know. Maybe my dreams. <laughs> um, right. So, um, so consciousness is consciousness of being a body. Now, I mean, like, I'm not going to talk again. I talked a little bit last time about Descartes' dualism. Of course, this isn't about Descartes. I've probably spent too much about him already. Um, but um, but uh, I mean, the way Coates experiences this anyway, or the way Coates thinks of this is as finding that I just am a body. Um, um, right, so consciousness means like materialism. And materialism is somehow connected, at least in Coates' mind, with atheism, right? So, I mean, it's easy to see, roughly speaking, how these could be connected. I mean, they often are connected. Um, uh, um, and they are presumably connected in Hobbes, even though Hobbes says that he's not an atheist, right? <laughs> but everyone knows he is. <laughs> um, so, uh, um, but I guess the question is like, um, it's not this simple, but I mean, because like, which one comes first, like which one does this, Coats want because of which, basically. Um, so I think that um, a big part of, at least, of what Coates wants from atheism is materialism. Um, Right, that is, uh, he sees um, the Christian God, and at first he's mostly thinking about the Black Church here. He makes 
explicit sometimes. The Christian God is um, um, similar to what Nietzsche says about the Christian God, right? But it, yet, that it's a way of thinking that there's another world where, right? So, um, um, so the main point here about atheism is not whether an infinitely perfect substance exists, right? Like it's that's that's not the issue that he's interested in. It's like whether we can rely on some kind of compensation for the evils of this world. Um, so like whether when we're defeated, we should think of that as only a temporary defeat on the way to the goal, or whether um, it's, that means we end in defeat. And um, uh, I mean, as I said, it's more complicated. I guess you could say that's what he wants from both of us, <laughs> right? Like the what he's what what consciousness or awakeness is supposed to be um, achieving is to um, not think that. Your, that our lives are submerged in a goal that we're all headed towards. Um, because Coates thinks um, that This kind of goal orientation, right? There's like an end of history. There's like a um, uh, what Hegel calls the good infinite, as opposed to the bad infinite, right? There's um, there's something there's there's some there's something we're headed for that is the meaning of everything that's happening. He thinks that is. Um, That erases our value as individuals. So he's an individualist of some kind. <laughs> um, so for example, here's something he says about this on page 70. Um, you must resist the common urge towards, com towards the comforting narrative of divine law, toward fairy tales that imply some irrepressible justice. The enslaves were not bricks, bricks in your road, and their lives were not chapters in your redemptive history. They were people turned to fuel for the American machine. Enslavement was not destined to end. And it is wrong to claim our present circumstances, no matter how improved, as the redemption for the lives of people who never asked for the posthumous, untouchable glory of dying for their children. Our triumphs can never compensate for this. Right? So he's so he's um put it on the but right, so like the reason awakeness to our corporeity um, is important is that um, it means knowing that each of us is, as he sometimes says, a one-on-one. <laughs> I don't know if that's a quote from Malcolm X or something. I was I tried to, to determine where that comes from using Google and I wasn't successful, so I didn't try very hard. Um, but in any case, right, that's one of Coates's words for this kind of irreplaceable individuality, right? That you shouldn't think that somehow, um, uh, somewhere the death of the, in the, the, the suffering and death of the individual can be um, redeemed, right? Like bought back <laughs> um, in the currency of, um, like the great destiny that they were part of.
Um, So it's, I mean, like I said, you, does that come from materialism or from atheism? It's both. It's like the kind of um, theism he's worried about is the theism that says that like everything has a higher purpose. Um, um, and the kind of material, uh, like immaterialism he's worried about is the kind that says that whatever bad things happen now, you'll be compensated for somewhere else. Um, so uh, so basically, like what he wants from materialism and atheism is kind of the same as what Grant wanted to get from Eastern Orthodox theology. Right? It's like the, the separation of, I don't remember if I managed to talk about that when I talked about Grant about how Grant associates the view that the necessary is the good with um, Catholic, like Roman Catholic theology um, and um, implicitly contrasting it to, to Eastern Orthodox theology. So, I mean, uh, um, but like what he wants from that, again, what Grant wants from that is the idea that um, um, when people suffer here, you shouldn't think that you can see why that was good. That you can ascertain through faith that that was good or something like that. Um, Grant calls that blasphemy. Um, so you mean, I mean, Coates is basically saying the same thing. <laughs> um, so like, um, here's what he said on page 79. He's talking about his reaction to the memorial service for Prince Joan that he went to. He says, uh, raised conscious in rejection of a Christian God, I could see no higher purpose in Prince's death. I believe and still do that our bodies are ourselves, that my soul is the voltage conducted through neurons and nerves, and that my spirit is my flesh. Prince Jones was a one of one and they had destroyed his body. So, um, so it's like Grant, it's saying that, you know, there's no reason to think history is headed towards something good. Um, again, Coates is saying, because there is no God, Grant is saying, because that's the wrong way to think about God. Um, but, um, but they also agree that Coates, like Grant, like denies that this makes him a pessimist or Coates says a cynic, right? So like, I guess neither of these terms is really precise here for what they're trying to get across. Um, but both of them give some kind of idea of what they're trying to deny, right? They're, they're, they're trying to deny that this is a negative judgment on the world. Um, um, so this is saying no to the world. So back on page 71, right over after the passage I, I read um, a moment ago. Um, I am not a cynic. I love you, I love the world, and I love it more with every new inch I discover.
right? So the world is the world is good, even though it's terrible, right? That was in the quote that I read to begin with when he says, when when he says what it is, he says, well, when he says what it is he wants for Samori, and he compares this consciousness and the cosmopolitanism, he says, I want you to be a conscious citizen of this beautiful, terrible world. Um, somehow, like, here's another thing I don't really know what to do with. Um, I mean, like this book is is difficult, actually. Right? I mean, this that is this book is difficult. Of course, not the way Heidegger is difficult, right? but it's not that far from the way Thoreau is difficult. Um, so there's a lot of things where right? you're you're not sure if you're like on a path that the author has made deliberately. Or if you're just wandering off into the forest, <laughs> um, but but in any case, that sentence which says, "I love you and I love the world," um, and I had to look this up because I'm no expert on the New Testament. <laughs> but even though I guess this is one of the most famous verses in the New Testament, <laughs> right? Um, uh, John three sixteen. For God so loved the world, and what it says that God love bears on cosmos, the cosmos. Yeah, this is accusative, whatever. Uh, but um, but right, so God so loved the cosmos. That he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Somehow, this is, it seems like it's, I don't know, it's not the relation it was supposed to be. It's like a deliberate inversion of that verse or something like that. Um, I, again, I don't know. Is Coates thinking about the, the Bible? He, he says that, like, unlike his parents, um, you know, that his parents were brought up doing like Bible recitations, but the, they didn't bring him up that way. Um, so on the other hand, you know, like, um, I'm Jewish and even I know this verse. <laughs> yeah. Um, so maybe he's thinking of it. If so, again, I don't know whether he's saying, um, I mean, the first has all the same pieces as his sentence, right? There's the sun and there's loving the world and, you know, um, but um, is, is he saying that this is a version of that or that this is like the, well, I mean, is he saying it's a version of that or that it's like an inversion? Um, I'm not sure. But so in any case, so like we have the like on the one hand, um we're saying um he well he's saying to his son, don't think that there is a goal that everything is heading towards. Thinking that is disrespecting individual. Um, erasing their value. Um, this is one of the many things that makes me think of loving us when I read this book. But in any case, so like rather think that, and I mean, and it seems really, it seems grim. Here's like, here's another quote on page 70 when you're talking about this individual slave that he's imagined. And he says, when she dies, the world, which is really the only world she can ever know, ends. For this woman, enslavement is not a parable. It is damnation. It is never-ending night. 
And yet, how can that be reconciled with saying, um, but I love the world and every inch of it I discover. Right? I mean, a lot of the inches of it discovered as a journalist are like not the kind of inches you might think you would love. Um, so, I mean, the, the reconciliation of these two things has to do with, I mean, it has to do precisely with trying to get rid of this, with moving. I mean, this is too neat, what I'm about to say. It's too neat because of some of the things he says about hope towards the end of the book. But just like as a, um, at least as a first pass, um, we're going from hope as a theological virtue, right? Like, um, I mean, it's one of the three theological virtues, <laughs> hope, faith, and uh, charity, I guess. <laughs> um, so, uh, or, and it's also, right, it's like one of Kant's three questions. What can I know? What ought I to do? And for what can I hope? Right? We're going from that to struggle. Struggle is the, um, um, the temporary local thing that has value in itself and not merely as a means. And he says, this is still on page 71, which I guess is so like this, these two pages here are an important um, passage for these purposes. This is not despair. These are the preferences of the universe itself, verbs over nouns, actions over states, struggle over hope. So, you know, um, in saying this comes from a mistaken understanding of what the universe is like. Um, uh, that the universe, and this kind of contradicts what I was saying about the meaning of the cosmos here. But anyway, like that the universe is good as a totality, <laughs> that it's good, you know, um, when you add it all up, even though the pieces are bad. But this that's a very traditional answer to the problem of evil, right? I mean, it's in the fourth meditation, but it's not only there every time. Um, so uh, um, to this, which says, um, the pieces have their own value. Um, and so, you know, it's almost the opposite. Although the whole is terrible, <laughs> it's beautiful because every piece of it contains this struggle. And this is why he feels sad for the dreamers, right? I mean, he actually feels pity for the for the people he calls the dreamers. Now, I, I mean, I think the dreamers are the same as the people who must believe that they're white. I think those are interchangeable. I'm not 100% sure about that. Um, but, um, um, Anyway, like uh, both of those terms come together at the beginning of the book, right? When he says after ha having left the recording studio after that interview, 
he felt an indistinct sadness and he realized that he was feeling sad because um, it was as if he had been trying to wait to um, awaken the host from the most gorgeous dream. <laughs> um, so uh, So like the the dreamers, um, because they're not awake, they're like they're nowhere. Um, they think they've gotten it beyond this struggle. Um, but that actually means that they've lost the world and themselves. <laughs> like they're they're nothing and nowhere. Um, and uh this is also why he says, and like, this is a great line. I am sorry that I cannot make it okay. I am sorry that I cannot save you, Dash, but not that sorry. <laughs> Part of me thinks that your very vulnerability brings you closer to the meaning of life. Just as for others, the quest to believe oneself white divides them from it. And then a little bit farther down, you have been cast into a race. So like that could be understood as a pun, I guess. You have been cast into a race. I don't know. Anyway, you have been cast into a race in which the wind is always at your face and the hounds are always at your heels. And to varying degrees, this is true of all life. The difference is that you do not have the privilege of living in ignorance of this essential fact. Right, so again, you know, that um, your first impulse is to say, I wish I could save you. I wish I could make it okay. But then the second thought is, well, not that sorry. Actually, um, this is the way that you, the world is. These are the preferences of the universe. If I could promise to make it okay, that would be like putting you to sleep. Um, and I mean, I think you can also put it this way that, uh, and you know, fear again is a major theme of the book that I haven't been able to spend much time on. It's obviously like fear is a very philosophically important emotion. Um, fear and Honest, right? If that's different from fear. Um, so, uh, um, but like, you know, so he says over and over again that all the Black people he's known have, have been terribly afraid and that he's terribly afraid. Um, and he, um, like as a boy in Baltimore, he imagines what you know, watching these untroubled boys playing with their toy trucks in the backyard or whatever. He imagines that they've escaped the fear and that he's stuck with it. But I think you can say that what he realizes later is that um, um, he has conscious fear of real disembodiment. So, right, this is the term he uses over and over. Of course, usually we think of, if you think of disembodiment, you think that means that you somehow float free of your body, <laughs> right? But of course, if you are your body, then disembodiment means annihilation. Um, so like real disembodiment is um, permanent death, never ending night. Um, and um, that's what he's afraid of. That's what he's consciously afraid of. Again, if if you disregard the, the 
the difference between fear and angst, you could say in Heidegger's terms that, that you know, this fear is being towards death. Um, um, living in the knowledge of your affinity. That's the fear he has. What about the people who believe themselves white or the, the dreamers? Well, they, they have an unconscious fear, right? A fear that comes out as self-delusion. And it's that fear that Descartes is talking about at the end of the first meditation, the fear of awakening. The fear of losing your false sense of disembodiment. Um, and falling back into your body. Okay. Um, so that's what I want to say about consciousness for now. Like I said, I think both of these will come back again next time, but I want to go on to talk about cosmopolitanism. Unless other questions about what I was just saying? Some people are frowning. <laughs> that, that would be good if someone was like, that can't be right because. You know, even though I probably will need some of this for working in the photo. Right, so the other thing I was mentioning was cosmopolitanism. So, I mean, I think there's really like two aspects to this, although obviously they go together somehow. And maybe in the last part of the book, it becomes clearer how they go together. Maybe not. But, um, but so, but at least one aspect of it is the rejection of nationalism, right? And so obviously, cosmopolitanism is one way of understanding it is it's the opposite of nationalism. Because if you're going to regard yourself as a citizen of the world, then you're um, in some way uh, out of the specific relation to your nation that nationalism implies. And I mean, sure enough, cosmopolitanism has, you know, like uh, I think I think uh, Vladimir Putin has like bad things to say about cosmopolitanism, right? Like the like contemporary, but but also that part of the American right, <laughs> the nationalist American right, has bad things to say about cosmopolitanism. Sometimes people say it's a code for talking about Jews, and maybe it's that too, but, uh, but even forgetting that, it's like uh, just on a literal level, it's clear why if you're a nationalist, you wouldn't like this. Um, so, uh, um, and I think, um, so I, I'm not, like I said before, I'm not sure I'm discussing these in the right order. I mean, they, if you, I mean, they go together, but if you wanted to arrange it in chronological order, in a way it's this move away from nationalism that comes first, right? Like that's more associated with this time and power as opposed to the consciousness stuff, which I mean, in some sense he always had. Um, but he didn't maybe understand it completely. But um, but it you know it comes out more in his reaction to the death of Prince Jones. Um, so but you know be that as it may, uh, um, his what he says he learned at Howard or at the Mecca was and I mean and this is something like what Malcolm X learned at the real Mecca. Right, like Malcolm X um, abandoned the nation of Islam after he, you know, he came back from Mecca and became a um, Sunni Muslim. Um, so the nation of Islam, obviously, as you can tell from the 
name is nationalist. <laughs> um, right, but again, I don't know how to take that any farther. Um, but, um, but he tells the story of how he moved away from nationalism. Um, partly by way of his change in reaction to this quote attributed to Saul Bellow. So I'm going to talk about that for a while because it's really interesting. Um, and it brings up a lot of interesting things, right? So um, on page, first brings this up on page 43. Before that, he's been talking about how official his, in, in official history, everyone who did who mattered was white. Um, and um, and he felt that he had to find a black history to like match against that. And he says, this was all distilled for me in a quote I once read from the novelist Saul Bella. I can't remember where I read it or when, only that I was already at Howard. Who was the Tolstoy of the Zulos, Bellow quipped. So, now, I mean, um, So this is something that Bellow uh, was quoted as saying in a profile in New York Times Magazine in 1988. Um, later, he always denied that he'd actually said it. <laughs> but it's part of a long, I think it's like, who is the Tolstoy of the Zulus? Who is the like Pushkin of the Papuans? I would gladly read them or something like that. So, I mean, I don't know. I'm inclined to think he did say it. He just denied it, but I'm not sure. Uh, Saul Bellow seems to have, you know, some problems with stuff like this. Um, but in any case, uh, of course, it's meant as a rhetorical question, right? You're supposed to, you're supposed to say, well, you know, that Zulus didn't have a Tolstoy, right? Um, I mean, he actually said it in the context of, and we'll see, well, I'll just say what the context was and then. So he actually said it in the context of like demands to expand the canon or like, you know, like criticism of great books curriculum, right? So, and he was saying like, well, you know, yeah, it would make, it would make sense to bring in great books written by the Zulus if they had written any great books, but they don't. Um, um, so, uh, however, that's not exactly the context in which Coates deals with that. Um, because, it, and I mean, we'll see from the resolution he reaches, which doesn't really address that part of the question, right? I mean, he sees this as a question of like, um, who can the Zulus come up as with as a champion, like to show that they're good too? Right? You, you understand that's a somewhat different question. It's not exactly the same issue. Um, but all right, so 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 that's the question, and the answer is supposed to be no one. Um, and. Um, um, Coates says that, you know, at that time he was like immersed in these theories of the great, you know, unknown civilizations of Africa. Um, the, um, 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 how like black Africans had actually invented everything and you know and um and they were 
uh, and then it was like this history has been erased and yeah. So like Chancellor Williams is, is um, one of the people behind this way of thinking. And he says that like Chancellor Williams book, the destruction of African civilization was like his Bible or something like that. Um, and he says about this, this is on page 45. Um, the theory relieved me of certain troubling questions. This is the point of nationalism. And it gave me my Tolstoy. I read about Queen Zinga, right? So this is Queen Zinga or Nijinga. Um, and she was the queen of, well, she, First, she was the queen of Dongo, and then when the Portuguese invaded most of Dongo, she invaded this other kingdom, Matamba, became the queen of Matamba. <laughs> um, is known as the Jinga of Dongo and Bobanda, um, or no, Matamba, <laughs> sorry. Um, so, you know, and um, what did she do? Well, she didn't write War and Peace or something. I mean, <laughs> Right, <laughs> like um, she was a warrior queen, right? So, in other words, like if you wanted to know who should we put to represent Africa in the great books course, this wouldn't be an answer. She didn't write anything, right? Uh, I mean, she was illiterate, I think, um, but although she had like people working for her, knew how to write. Um, so, uh, um but it is, it is supposed to be an answer to, you know, where are the great heroes of black civilization? Um, and he recounts probably the most famous story about her that at some point she's, he says he's dead, negotiating with the Dutch, but I feel like this was actually negotiating with the Portuguese. But in any case, whoever she was negotiating with, they were they were sitting on a chair and they didn't provide her with one. So she says to one of her advisors, like, come here, get on your knee, get in your hand and knees, and she sits on the advisor. <laughs> right? Like the show that uh, um, she's a queen and she can provide herself with a chair. <laughs> uh -huh. So uh um, so 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 that's Coates at early in his time at Howard, thinking that um, that this is the like this is an example of the kind of great hero that he can use to um, provide an answer to Saul Bellow. When Saul Bellow says, um, "Who is the Tolstoy of the?" Zulus, he can say, well, for example, in the Jinga. And this is what he was taught by Linda Haywood, who um, was a member of the history department and later published a book about Queen Jinga, which I read, and which has an endorsement on it from Coates. <laughs> this is the Njinga we need. <laughs> Right. So, but anyway, this is what he learned from Linda Haywood. This is on page 54. When she told the story of Nzinga conducting negotiations upon the woman's back, she told it without any fantastic gloss, and it hit me hard as a sucker punch. Among, among the people in that room all those centuries ago, my body, breakable at will, endangered in the streets, fearful in the schools, was not closest to the, squee to, to the queens, but to her advisors, who'd been broken down into a chair so that a queen, heir to everything she'd ever seen, could sit. Right? So what he, he learns how to re, like, turn the story around <laughs> and say, um, uh, I mean, in a sense, it's true that she's like the heroes of white history, but not in a good way. 
right? She liked the histories of white heroes of white history in that he got where she is by dominating other people's thoughts. Um, as a matter of fact, she um, was like heavily involved in the slave trade. And a lot of her fighting against the Portuguese um, in, in alliance with the Dutch at some at some points was an attempt to um, get back the con control of the territory that was lucrative for producing slaves. <laughs> um, so, uh, um, so this is obviously a blow to nationalism. Right, this makes him think, and I think this is related to what he says to Samori later in the book when he says, "Like, remember that this consciousness must um, not be racial; that it must ultimately be cosmic." Um, that um, um, I wish I knew how to put this carefully. I think Coates, Coates knows how to put it carefully, and I don't. <laughs> but that, um, because I mean, it would be easy to say so the lesson you've learned is like, there's, you know, it doesn't, there's no real difference in black and white. It's just there's good people and bad people, or there's dominators and dominated, or something like that. Um, and you know, like perhaps the like Marxist lesson that what's really going on everywhere is a class conflict. And what we need is like solidarity of the proletariat. <laughs> okay. So um, but it, I mean, but it, I Coates doesn't want to take exactly that motive, moral approach. Um, um but he does want to take the moral that um, um, you shouldn't think uh, you shouldn't think you 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 can get out of the struggle that you're in by like. Um, Imagining that you're uh, um, that you don't really belong here, that you're really part of something else, that the something else in itself is powerful and um, um, dominating and. and um, uh, you just have to identify with that. So, I mean, this is part of the lesson, but then there's this other part. This is on page 56. Right, I mean, so right before this, he says, this fear ran so deep that we accepted bare standards of civilization and humanity, right? Like, um, that's what, like, would elevate Najinga to, I mean, I mean, of course, she was a hero in some ways, and I don't think he's denying that, but, um, but not in the way he wanted a hero. Um, so, right, so the fear ran so deep that we accepted their standards of civilization and humanity, and then a new paragraph, but not all of us. It must have been around that time that I discovered an essay by Ralph Wiley, in which he responded to Bellow's quip. Tolstoy is the Tolstoy of the Zulus, wrote Wiley. Unless you find a prophet in fencing off universal properties of mankind into exclusive tribal ownership. And there it was. I had accepted Bello's premise. In fact, Bello was no closer to Tolstoy than I was to Nzinga.
right? So Tolstoy, this is Bello, although again, he denied having said this, but uh, this is Bello, and this is Wiley, Wiley's response. Tolstoy is the Tolstoy of the zoo. Now, I mean, so you can see, I think this is why I emphasize the, that the context is the coach is in isn't really the original context. Because in the original context, this wouldn't be a very good answer, right? Like if we're saying, um, uh, you know, you need to open up the canon and include other great books from other people, and, and you, you say, well, okay, well, who's the Tolstoy of the Zulus? And the answer is Tolstoy is the Tolstoy of the Zero Zulus, sorry. Then, like, that doesn't add anything to the canon. You're just still up with Tolstoy. Um, but when the, when the context having shifted to, like, you know, who can the Zulus produce as their champion? Um, and implicitly, Bella was saying, like, I can produce Tolstoy as my channel. Right. And, you know, so um, Coates says, uh, um, Bella was no closer to Tolstoy than I was to Bazinga. <laughs> right. Meaning, like, Tolstoy isn't your champion in Bella. Tolstoy is Tolstoy, and Tolstoy is the Zulu's champion, too. Now, um, I think it's worth, I mean, maybe this is only because I'm proud that I managed to find this. It's like one of the problems with, one of the problems with official scholarly literature is that like everything is overrun by footnotes. And trying to show that you've read everything that everyone else in the field has written and so forth. On the other hand, one of the problems of like popular literature review is that there are no footnotes. <laughs> so, um, so it actually wasn't easy to find where Ralph Wiley says this. Actually, like if you look up Ralph, Ralph Wiley, if you Google Ralph Wiley, it will say that he's a, he, was a, he was a sports writer which he was a sports writer, but he also wrote several books of essays. Um, he died in 2004. And this essay is in this collection, it's called Dark Witness. One of, I think, his first one is called Why Black People Tend to Shout. And then there's one called What Black People Should Do Now. And then this one's called Dark Witness. When Black People Should Be Sacrificed, parentheses again. So, um, um, and it's actually from an essay about Mark Twain. Mark, Ralph Wiley loved Mark Twain. Mark Twain was his hero. And this essay is called, What's Up With This Mad Mark Twain? And this is on page 31. I have been snidely asked if I aspire to be the black Mark Twain. So Wiley always puts the words black and white in their racial sense in scare quotes. That's probably show the disagreement between him and Trump. But in any case, so I have been asked, snidely asked, if I aspire to be the black Mark Twain. That aspiration has already been aspirated. <laughs> I could never be the black Mark Twain. Mark Twain is the black Mark Twain, and the white one too. I aspire only to be some of the Ralph Wileys. Um, and then a little bit farther down, I also am running a deficit, oh, Twain. He has shown me the beauty and absurdities. Contrast that subversive wit with the Nobel Prize winning American author of the 20th century who could draw himself up and haughtily ask, 
Who is the Tolstoy of the Zulus? As if there were no reply, Tolstoy is the Tolstoy of the Zulus. Unless you find a prophet in fencing off universal properties of mankind into exclusive tribal ownership. <laughs> Wayne put it this way. If you pick up a starving dog and make him prosperous, he will not bite you. This is the principal difference between a dog and a man. <laughs> and then Wiley adds, the Nobel Prize is exclusively for humans then. <laughs> All right. Anyway, Wiley is, is actually extremely funny. So, um, so, but like why read all that other than just because I'm proud that I managed to find it? Well, because um, um, it's clear that um, at least in Wiley's case, and the question is, does Coates agree with this? In Wiley's case, it's clear that at the same time as he's claiming Tolstoy as a Tolstoy of the Zulus and everyone else, um, he's also giving up the claim to be the black Mark Twain himself, right? And like ceding that to Mark Twain. Um, and implicitly saying that the Ralph Wileys are the Ralph Wileys of everyone. Um, and, you know, does Coates agree with that or not? Is Coates saying, I mean, and like, this is an important question for, for us, or especially for me, because whatever happens here is not your fault, but it's my fault, right? Like, is my use of this book in this course legitimate? What do you, like, uh, um, or is it just another way of using Coates' body for like my own purpose? <laughs> Um, and I, you know, and I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Um, so this was something I couldn't find, but I remember when the book first came out, which was a long, long time before I first read it. Um, but. Uh, well, it couldn't be that long, right? 2015. But anyway, years before I first read it, I remember like hearing an interview or something on the radio, I think. And it was, I guess the like the book launch was took place at some kind of like black nationalist bookstore. And quote Coates was I, was it on the radio and I heard him say this, or was it written and I saw him quoted saying this? But he was saying something like, I'm glad it was launched here because this isn't really a book for white America. This is really a book for blacks. Um, you know, um, which I mean, even if that's if that's true, it would be specific to this book, I guess, right? Because he, you know, when he wrote for the Atlantic. And, and wrote a blog for the Atlantic and whatever. I mean, obviously, that's not a way to reach an audience of only blacks. Um, but I feel like the story about this book must be a little more complicated than that, too. I mean, in some sense, the only audience is Samori. Um, but, you um, I mean, the, the two the two cases aren't parallel. He wouldn't be inconsistent if he said Tolstoy is a Tolstoy of the Zulus, but like, um, I am not the coats of you. <laughs> it wouldn't be inconsistent because after all, like the Zulus didn't enslave Tolstoy's ancestors and create a ghetto that Tolstoy had to live in and whatever, right? I mean, it's not um, exactly parallel, but Wiley does draw the so um, 
that's what I wish I understood better. Again, there may be some things that he says in the reading for next time that will help approach this. Um, okay, so like, um, Sorry, I'm trying to decide in what order to talk about some things. I'm still going to start with the order they're here in my notes, although probably to that. But because I mean, there, okay, so the problem is that I want to talk about, so I said to begin with cosmopolitanism, one thing it's about is rejection of nationalism. There's still something left to say about rejection of nationalism, but yeah, no, maybe I should say that first. I mean, it's mostly another promise that that I'm going to talk about something next time, which makes next time sound like it's getting too broad, but <laughs> we'll see. Anyway, um, so like, it's not clear. Um, what the move away from nationalism means about Coates's relationship to America. I haven't said almost anything about America, you know, for like the first time ever in this course. <laughs> a, a, a long time since I've said anything about America. Um, um, So on the one hand, you might say, um, that, uh, the rejection of America, like the claim not to be an American would be something from, you could take from Malcolm X that would survive this. Um, one of Malcolm X's speeches that Coates mentioned that he used to um, have a cassette of and he would play it in his Walkman as he went around um, is called The Ballot or the Bullet. And like there's a long riff in the middle of it on like, you know. I don't consider myself to be an American. I'm, a, you know, I'm one of the 22 million victims of America, and I'm not a flag waver, et cetera, et cetera. Right? And you might think that, like, um, that the realization that I can't compensate for that by inventing my own civilization, you know, that. Um, um, is going to uh, fight back, <laughs> eventually reassert its greatness, whatever, or something like that. Um, you might think that you could get rid of that part, but still keep the, the negative part about America. And I mean, certainly, like on page 52, when Coates first talks about this, um, Um, it began to strike me that the point of my education was a kind of discomfort, was the process that would not award me my own especial dream, but would break all the dreams, all the comforting myths of Africa, of America, and everywhere, and would leave me only with humanity in all its terribleness. Um, Right, meaning that uh, the supposed great civilization of Africa, the supposed great civilization of America, these are both, um, right, like what Declare said at the end of the anarchism, that's, you know, these, uh, 
these are both like dreams that we have to wake up out of. Um, and what we'll be left with is, and finally, we're late enough that instead of saying men, he says humanity, right? <laughs> you have to really, I mean, literally, even in the 80s, people are still saying men, men, men. Um, but okay, so. Um, um, so that's one thing, but even worse than that, and this is one of, I guess, I mean, it's supposed to be disturbing. I guess, well, no, again, that the question is, who's the audience? Is it supposed to be disturbing or is it not supposed to be disturbing? First, it's certainly supposed to be disturbing to a white audience. Right, this is his reaction to September 11th, 2001. And he says, looking out upon the ruins of America, my heart was cold. Um, I mean, I could read more of this here, but... Um, I could see no difference between the officer who killed Prince Jones and the police who died or the firefighters who died. They were not human to me, black, white, or whatever. They were the menaces of nature. They were the fire, the comet, the storm, which could, with no justification, shatter my body. The firefighter somehow is particularly, like, firefighters didn't shoot Prince Jones. <laughs> Um, so, uh, but it's, but the firefighters are part of the dream about this. Um, and he says that the financial district where the, you know, Twin Towers were was like formerly a slave market, which is true, although it was from 1711 to 1762. <laughs> It was quite a while before the Twin Towers were built there. Um, but um, um, that certainly sounds like a complete, that sounds like it could end like, well, I mean, like he mentions flag waving and whatever, the ridiculous pageantry, pageantry of flags, the machismo of firemen, the overwrought slogans. Damn it all, Prince Jones was dead, and hell upon those who tell us to be twice as good and shoot us no better, etc. So, like, you know, that sounds like he's invoking Malcolm. Uh, I don't know if I'm on a first name basis with him. Sounds like he's invoking Malcolm X. Um, and that. Um, Whatever is being rejected in Africa is being rejected more strongly in America. On the other hand, as I pointed out before, he always called America my country. Um, and we'll see, so this is where I promise to talk about it next time. We'll see more about this, especially when he goes to France. I think, but not only when he goes to France, also in the, in part three, there's more about this. Um, so, I mean, for now, all I can say is, um, it's like this rejection of nationalism is certainly not like automatically an acceptance of um, like, uh, I don't know, Frederick Douglass, Position that blacks should should become American, should be Amer should see themselves as American. Um, although it's also not clear exactly how it's different. Okay. Um, um, and like again, depending on how you answer that, depends on like how you see Coke as an American philosopher. 
was the philosopher of America. Um, so we'll try to talk about more of that about that next time. Um, but the other thing I wanted to mention about cosmopolitanism is that um, for Coates, this is not necessarily just the opposite of nationalism, although it is that, but there's another aspect to it. So, I mean, because there's also like on an individual level, I don't know if that's the right way to put it. On a personal level, there's an issue of cosmopolitanism. Um, and this is something that um, this is something that I think Coates thanks not the Howard University History Department, but thanks Samori for. Us. So, you know, because like, um, again, Samori is somehow what's between him and the world, connecting him to the world. And like now we can think, right? So, I mean, as I mentioned last time, you can see between the world and me as what divides me from the world. And he's clearly, he clearly means that although in different senses throughout the books, but you could also see between the world and me as like the bridge between the world and me. Um, and um, I think at least one of the ways that that's true is that, you know, so there's like three things he's, he's really afraid of when it comes to Samori. One, obviously, is that he'll be killed by the police or something like that, right? The second one is that he'll allow himself to be deluded, right? That he'll allow himself to be convinced that, that what his father's telling him isn't true and be like seduced by the dream, basically. Um, but the third one is that Samori's life will be distorted by Coates' fears for him. Um, and those first two, right, that he'll be killed, the one that he'll be deluded is another. These both push towards um, nothing has changed, right? Um, hear the truth from me. It's it's. Same as when I was a boy in Baltimore. Don't let yourself be fooled. Um, but the third one pushes in the opposite direction. I'm going to write this in a shorthand way that won't make sense unless you, you hear what I said about it, right? That like he's afraid that, that Samori's life will be distorted by his, by Coates's fear of life. Um, in a version of the kind of like tough love that he says that he got from his parents. Um, and um, um, that's what pushes towards saying you should be a citizen of the world. Um, I'm almost out of time, but uh, it should be two things should I read? I'll read this one, I guess. No, I guess I'll read this one. This is actually from the reading from, from last week. It's on page 21. Your life is so very different from my own. The grandness of the world, the real world, the whole world is a known thing for you. Right? That's what he sees Samori as being able to achieve um, if he can restrain himself. 
Um, maybe I do have to read the other part too. This is on page 90, bottom of page 91. So he's talking about this um, um, Ninety-one, talking about this time when they they um, took Samori to visit a preschool, and there's like this, as he says, bubbling ethnic stew of New York children playing, and Samori just like takes off and runs and starts playing with them, and he says, "You have never been afraid of people of rejection, and I have always admired you for this, and always been afraid for you because of this." He says, having had an impulse to pull him back. Um, um, but now I understand the gravity of what I was proposing, that a four-year-old child should be watchful, prudent, and shrewd, that I can truly curtail your happiness, that you submit to a loss of time. And now when I measure this fear against the boldness that the masters of the galaxy impart to their own children, I am ashamed. Right, so cosmopolitanism means not just um, seeing beyond nationalism, but um, not allowing yourself to be, um, not allowing the fear to stand between you and the world so that you don't see the whole world and the real world. Oh, okay, that's all I have time for. I will see you one more time on Thursday.